Six months after the ink dried on my divorce papers, a fragile sense of normalcy had settled. Erin, my now eight-year-old daughter, and I were building a new life together. Our tiny apartment, buzzing with laughter, and the aroma of freshly baked cookies was a world away from the sterile perfection John had insisted upon. Erin's artwork adorned the fridge, a vibrant testament to her blossoming creativity, a stark contrast to the carefully curated collection of antiques that had once occupied the space. But the serenity was shattered one afternoon by a frantic call from Mom. John, my ex-husband, and his mother had barged into their house, demanding to see me. Confusion morphed into annoyance as I rushed over. They sat smugly on the living room sofa, John's face the picture of audacity. We need the money you owe us, he declared, his smugness grating on my nerves. Excuse me? I shot back, incredulous. There's no money I owe you. It had been a clean break. No alimony, no debt. A conscious effort to move forward. John's mother, a woman I could barely tolerate during our marriage, chimed in with a pointed cough. But Aaron, dear, she drawled, you took half of John's assets in the divorce settlement. The audacity of it all. They'd been complicit in his controlling ways, the way he tried to guilt trip me into quitting my job, a job I excelled at. They seemed to conveniently forget the years I'd borne the brunt of household chores and childcare while John dabbled in part-time jobs, claiming his artistry wouldn't flourish under the constraints of a full-time schedule. A slow burn ignited within me. Look around, Mrs. Miller, I said, my voice surprisingly calm despite the anger bubbling beneath the surface. This is my life now. Do you see any gold-plated furniture or a swimming pool? Erin, sensing the tension, slipped her hand into mine. Her small hand was a comforting reminder of what truly mattered. John, I continued, my gaze unwavering. The only debt you owe me is an apology for the years of manipulation. John's smugness faltered. His mother opened her mouth to retort, but I cut her off. This conversation is over. Get out of my parents' house. There was no room for negotiation in my tone. The stunned silence that followed was broken only by the click of the front door closing behind them. I sank onto the sofa, relief washing over me. The audacity of their visit had backfired. They hadn't landed a financial blow. They'd unintentionally served as a stark reminder of the manipulative family I'd left behind. Erin snuggled beside me, her eyes filled with curiosity. Taking a deep breath, I explained the situation in simple terms. Daddy and his mom made a mistake, I concluded, pulling her close. Our life here is just fine. She nodded, her trust in me unwavering. This incident, however unwelcome, served as a turning point. My focus became laser sharp, a renewed determination to provide Aaron with a secure and happy life. My career flourished, my colleagues becoming a source of unwavering support, with the help of my parents, we transformed our apartment into a haven filled with love and laughter. Secondhand furniture, repurposed with paint and creativity, became cherished pieces. The walls, once bare and cold, became canvases for Aaron's artwork, transforming the space into a vibrant reflection of our lives. John and his mother remained a distant memory, a cautionary tale of entitlement and manipulation. Aaron, now thriving in a stable environment, blossomed into a bright, confident young girl. My life as a single mother had its challenges, but it was also a life brimming with joy, independence, and a love so fierce it knew no bounds. The future, once clouded by John's deceit, stretched before us, an open canvas waiting to be painted with the vibrant colors of our new life. We would face challenges, of course, but we would face them together, a team forged in resilience and love. The aroma of freshly roasted coffee filled the air, a bittersweet reminder of the family life slowly slipping through my fingers. Exhausted from another late shift, I longed for the days when Natalie, my daughter, wouldn't be asleep by the time I arrived home. Thankfully, at 11 years old, she was mature enough to handle some independence. John, in turn, had ramped up his hours at the cafe, his newfound fascination with coffee roasting spilled over into his work, and his concoctions at home were truly exceptional. Yet, beneath the veneer of a happy family, a chasm was forming. My relentless focus on work had blinded me to the growing distance between us. The first hint came from Natalie herself. Tears welled up in her eyes as she hesitantly approached me. Mom, 
she began. I saw Dad with another woman the other day. My initial shock gave way to a tightening in my chest. She described the encounter, a casual intimacy that spoke volumes. Further details followed. Hushed phone calls, John's distracted behavior, his phone constantly glued to his hand. My heart ached for her. Middle school was a time of heightened sensitivity, and I hadn't realized how my workaholic tendencies had impacted her. Shame washed over me. Oh, sweetie, I said, pulling her into a hug. I'm so sorry, I haven't been present enough. Natalie surprised me with a small smile. It's okay, Mom. I understand you work hard. Her loyalty and understanding stung even more. I'll talk to Dad, okay? I promised, the words laced with a steely resolve. And if what you suspect is true, well, honey, divorce is an option. Her head bobbed up and down. I wouldn't want to be around him if he's doing something like that. The pain in her voice mirrored my own. Seeing my daughter's vulnerability served as a wake-up call. I immediately contacted a private investigator. The evidence was undeniable photographic confirmation of John's infidelity. But the kicker? It was Stacy, a seemingly happy stay-at-home mom from our high school group. Her child, barely five years old, seemed the furthest thing from her mind. Rage warred with disbelief. Stacy? How could a trusted friend betray me so deeply? Holding the photos, I envisioned the devastating impact revealing them would have on Natalie. Taking a deep breath, I locked them away, determined to handle this carefully. Then, a fortuitous opportunity arose. One of our mom friends had just gotten a new job. I suggested a reunion, hoping to use the gathering to gauge Stacy's demeanor. The coming days would be a delicate dance, piecing together the truth while ensuring Natalie's well-being remained paramount. My family might be fractured, but I wouldn't let it crumble. For Natalie, I would weather this storm and rebuild a future where the coffee table held not just coffee beans, but a foundation of trust, love, and unwavering devotion. The aroma of coffee, once a symbol of a life slipping away, would become a reminder of the strength I found within myself, the strength to create a new normal, a future brewed with resilience and hope. The reunion with my high school friends was a minefield. Stacy, the picture of innocence, chatted casually about her life as a stay-at-home mom. I played along, the photos of her infidelity burning a hole in my purse. The lawyer was prepped, the apartment hunt ongoing, the groundwork for my new life laid. Finally, the moment of truth arrived. As the conversation flowed, I dropped the bomb. So, Stacy, I began, voice calm yet firm, is having affairs with married men part of the new routine? The room plunged into stunned silence. Stacy's facade crumbled, her face drained of color, her eyes darting around the room for escape. My friends, initially defensive, gasped as they saw the photos laid bare on the table. Betrayal mirrored my own pain in their eyes. Stacy stammered a denial, but the evidence spoke for itself. She tearfully confessed, citing boredom and John's lack of attention as reasons. My heart ached for a moment, a flicker of empathy for her loneliness, but her justifications were hollow. Loneliness doesn't excuse betrayal, I said, my voice devoid of emotion, especially not of a friend and her family. The weight of her actions hung heavy in the air. Deciding not to let her tears sway me, I informed everyone about the impending divorce and the hefty alimony claim already filed. Stacy's husband, I knew, had received his certified notice. The righteous anger in my voice left no room for argument, Leaving Stacy to face her consequences, my friends and I walked out, a united front against betrayal. At home, John awaited me, panic etched on his face. Aaron, he stammered, what did you do to Stacy? The hypocrisy of his concern only fueled my anger. Don't insult my intelligence, John, I spat. Your affair is over. Consider it public knowledge courtesy of a very betrayed wife. His pleas for justification fell on deaf ears. His excuses mirrored Stacy's, a twisted logic born from guilt. I held firm, reminding him that secrecy and infidelity were the real terrible things. John's world was crumbling, but my focus had shifted. The divorce would happen, the pain would heal. I had Natalie, my loyal friends, and a wellspring of inner strength I hadn't known I possessed. The coffee table, once a symbol of a fractured family, would soon hold a different meaning. 
It wouldn't hold the bittersweet reminder of long work hours and missed connections. Instead, it would be a testament to my resilience, a testament to the new life I was building, a life brimming with the love and support of my daughter, the unwavering loyalty of my friends, and the quiet confidence of a woman who had faced adversity and emerged stronger. The future stretched before me like an open canvas, waiting to be painted with the vibrant colors of resilience, independence, and a love so fierce it knew no bounds. The lingering aroma of coffee wouldn't be a reminder of missed moments, but a comforting fragrance, a reminder of the strength I found within myself, the strength to create a new normal, a future brewed with resilience and hope. The sting of betrayal lingered, but like a stubborn weed, life pushed through the cracks. The divorce finalized, Natalie and I settled into our cozy new apartment. Alimony and child support from John, along with a hefty settlement from both John and Stacy, provided financial security. Yet the wounds of their deceit ran deep. Then, six months later, came another unwelcome surprise. My mother's frantic voice on the phone jolted me from a peaceful afternoon with Natalie. John and his mother had barged into their house demanding to see me. Confused and angry, I rushed over. There they sat, John and his mother on my parents' sofa, a picture of misplaced entitlement. We need the money you owe us, John declared, the audacity dripping from his voice. I bristled. Excuse me, I don't owe you a dime, I retorted. Remember the divorce settlement? John's mother, a woman I'd always disliked, chimed in with a pointed cough. But Aaron, dear, she drawled, you did walk away with half of John's assets. This was beyond infuriating. Assets? I scoffed. This apartment is hardly a castle. Did you see any gold-plated furniture here? They had conveniently forgotten who'd shouldered the financial burden for years while John dabbled in part-time jobs, blaming his art for the lack of a steady income. A slow burn ignited within me. Look around, Mrs. Miller, I said, my voice surprisingly calm despite the simmering anger. This is my life now. Do you see any evidence of extravagance? Just then, my father entered, sensing the tension. What's going on here? John launched into his fabricated tale, demanding I repay the wedding loan he'd supposedly given me. My father, a man of few words, was apoplectic. Loan? He boomed. You had an affair. Now you have the audacity to lie and harass my daughter? John, flustered and desperate, revealed Stacy's husband's alimony demands. My heart lurched for a moment, a flicker of empathy for his predicament, but it was quickly extinguished. He had only himself to blame. My father's reaction was swift and decisive. He feigned agreement, disappearing into another room with John and his mother in tow. Moments later, he reappeared, a mischievous grin on his face. Got everything, he announced, handing John a sealed envelope. John eagerly snatched it, his face a mask of relief. Now get out, my father thundered, his voice leaving no room for argument. With John and his mother scurrying away, the tension in the room dissipated. Relief and a touch of amusement washed over me. My father explained. The envelope, of course, contained nothing. He wouldn't give John a dime, but the elaborate charade had served its purpose. Later, watching Natalie's laughter echo through the apartment, a wave of gratitude washed over me. Life hadn't turned out as planned, but it had brought me closer to my daughter and revealed the strength I never knew I possessed. The future once clouded by betrayal, stretched before me like a blank canvas. This time, I held the brush, ready to paint a vibrant portrait of a future built on love, resilience, and the unwavering support of my family. John and his mother practically sprinted out of the house, clutching the envelope. Moments later, a cacophony of shouts and banging erupted from the front door. My father and I exchanged a sly smile. Looks like they just discovered the contents of your loan, he chuckled. John's voice echoed through the door, laced with fury. Open up, Aaron, this is fake money. Laughter bubbled up inside me. From Monopoly, no less, I called back, unable to resist a dig. Just thought I'd share some of our wealth, John. His angry tirade escalated, punctuated by the jarring sounds of kicking and pounding. Blinded by desperation, they hadn't considered the consequences of their theatrics. Just as they reached a fever pitch, sirens wailed in the distance, growing louder by the second. Our neighbors, drawn by the commotion, peeked outside their windows. John and his mother, 
oblivious to their approaching doom, continued their assault on the door. The police arrived, lights flashing, and wasted no time apprehending the two trespassers. The spectacle was almost comical. John and his mother, red-faced and disheveled, being hauled away in handcuffs. Our previously quiet street was now teeming with onlookers, eager to witness the conclusion of this unfolding drama. The repercussions were swift and severe. John not only got away with no money, but was slapped with a hefty fine for disorderly conduct and vandalism, our dented front door serving as stark evidence. Worse, news of his arrest reached the cafe. A regular customer, witness to the entire scene, relayed the incident to John's boss. Needless to say, he was fired on the spot. John's world had imploded spectacularly. Forced to move back with his parents, he became a burden on their already strained finances. Their alimony payments and his child support obligation now rested solely on their shoulders, a bitter irony in light of their audacity. Meanwhile, a restraining order ensured my family's safety. This final act of defiance brought a sense of closure, a symbolic severing of the ties that bound us to John and his manipulative mother. Life settled into a comfortable rhythm. Natalie's laughter and bright eyes filled our apartment with sunshine. I threw myself into work, drawing strength from her unwavering love and the newfound sense of freedom. This experience, while painful, had revealed a reserve of resilience I never knew I possessed. The future stretched before me, no longer clouded by betrayal. My heart, once bruised, was slowly healing. In its place, a quiet confidence bloomed. This was our fresh start, a future built on love, independence, and a bond with my daughter that had weathered the storm and emerged stronger. With each sunrise, I embraced the opportunity to paint a new life on our canvas, a vibrant masterpiece of resilience, self-sufficiency, and the unwavering love between a mother and daughter.